Okay, go ahead and turn in your, uh, in your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Is everybody doing something special today? Uh, I didn't hear enough yeses. Okay. Vivica, what are you doing today? <laughs> Having your mom take it easy. I'm guessing she's really going to like that. So you guys are getting in on this too, on the on the taking it easy. Karen, are you going to be taking it easy as well? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Wow. Sounds good. Don't don't blow it all. You want to spend so little money. Okay. <laughs> okay. Everyone. Okay. Hold on, Vivica. Let's. Everyone, look at me. That was supposed to be a secret. Yeah, like that's going to be kept a secret, right? Okay. Don't say anything about Red Lobster, okay? Because <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good job, Vivica. Well done. Well done. Okay. I got to take the mic back. Thank you. Good job. Taking care of mom. All you kids out there, mom likes it when you when you do stuff like that. It's fun. It's fun. Lord Jesus, I just pray that as we uh, as we approach your word this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would you would strengthen us and encourage us. Lord, I pray that you would help me um, to to preach your word and not my own. So I pray, Lord, that as we as we look at your word, as we look at what you have to teach us this morning, that you would strengthen us. Lord, even as uh, you say in, in the scripture, precept upon precept, we, we learn a little bit at a time, and we just pray, Lord, that we'd be able to take a, another step today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I've entitled uh, the sermon today, Joshua, Servant Leader. The passage in, uh, let's start with the scripture, actually. I think I'd like to start with that. Let's start with uh, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Wouldn't you love to hear this? Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to your fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do all, excuse me, do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. 
Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan, to go in to take possession of the promised land, the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess. I just can't imagine what it must have been feeling like for Joshua right at that moment to be at the River Jordan. You're you're coming to the culmination of the promise that God has given this people and that they've been waiting to come to pass for 400 years. And God says to you in the most solemn tone, Moses, my servant, is dead. And here you are knowing you're up. It's your turn. You're going to have to lead this people across into this promised land. The weight of that leadership on his shoulders must have been a pretty intense feeling, a pretty strong feeling of, I I would say, probably fear of just, oh, no. (laughs) How do I follow Moses? I mean, you know, think about this for a second, about the the plagues, the things that Moses called forth by the hand of God to get Israel into freedom, and then standing in front of the Red Sea with the Egyptian army coming, and the Lord says, Moses, boom, you know, part the Red Sea. How do you play second fiddle to that? I mean, wouldn't that be a, a strong feeling of, wow. God's just told me Moses is gone, and now you're supposed to lead. Ugh. And God says to him, you'll notice a couple of times in there, be strong, be courageous. Be strong, be courageous. And what I'm hearing in that, when I, when I hear the Lord say that to him, is that, Joshua, you're not really the leader. You're my servant. I'm the leader. You do what I tell you, You be strong and courageous. You step up, and nobody will be able to stand against you. You will succeed as long as you stay close with me. Let's go to the introduction. Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua, your training is over. Step up to the helm. According to God... Joshua was ready for a huge responsibility. But as Joshua assumed the role of leading the children of of Israel into the promised land, I'm fairly certain he felt overwhelmed by the enormity of the task. And that is a good thing. Because God chooses leaders on a different basis than we do. He wasn't looking for a super confident alpha male. He was looking for a servant. God wanted someone who would do His will and not pursue His own agenda. Jesus said, the one who would be great among you must be servant of all. Let us learn from Joshua the type of leader that God would have us to follow. Indeed, even the kind of leader that God would have us to be. Because leadership is everywhere, isn't it? Really, if you think about it, everybody has a role of leadership somewhere. Anybody in the room a parent? You can raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Any of you in the room ever lead at work, even informally? There's a, there's a, there's a task to be done, and people kind of go, you know, and they look at you. You're supposed to step up and lead in that role. We've got leadership all around us. It happens constantly. We even kind of pass the baton back and forth between one another, as it were, when situations come up. And it's, well, this is your expertise. You lead in this. I'll lead over here. So leadership touches us in all kinds of ways. And the Lord has a lot to say about leadership. But leading actually in God's way looks a whole lot different than the way the world tells us leadership is supposed to look. God wants us to serve. 
Not necessarily in the way that the world would teach us to serve. But leadership in the world can often look like dominance and not like service and caring. You know, I, I have an opportunity every week to, uh, to not lead every, every Monday morning. <laughs> because my leader is sitting right here in front of me. Every Monday morning, I go to Pilates. And Kathleen is the leader. And it's very clear who the leader is. She walks in and everybody goes, Kathleen, what do we do? Do we get weights today? Or do we get the ball? Or do we get the ring? What do we do? What's our, what's our role? Because we're there to follow what Kathleen is there to teach us that morning. And the thing that I so much appreciate about Kathleen, Mother's Day, Kathleen, you got you to gotta love this. I really appreciate the fact that you prepare for your class. I have taken Kathleen's class. My back was really bothering me. I had to give up my bike for a while, and she has helped me a great deal with my back getting much better, taking her class. But the thing that I have noticed about her class and why people enjoy your class so much is because it's very clear you're there to serve them. She never teaches or very rarely teaches the same routine two weeks in a row. That takes hours of time when she's not there in that class to learn that stuff and to, and to put it together in a rhythm and a flow so that you can, you can learn, that the people can follow you. And I just want to say thank you. You're welcome. But that's servant leadership. You think I'm leading all the time perhaps, because I'm the pastor here. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of times, you're leading, and you're leading me. We serve each other in this leadership whenever we're willing to step out and say, I'll go first. I'll be the one to say, hey, let's, let's do it this way, and let's go forward. There's a whole lot of areas that we're not strong in, and others are strong in, and we need their service, and we need them to lead and guide us in those things. So leadership is, is all around us, and we need to learn much about it. The leader is usually just simply the person who's setting the agenda, the person who's showing us the next step to take. But learning how to follow and learning how to, rather, to choose the right leader to follow is really, really important. you got to be careful who you follow because that leader's leading somewhere. And where they're going, you're likely to end up. And you'd like it to be a really good place, wouldn't you? But when, you get, when, you, when, you, when you're choosing a leader, you've got to think that through a little bit. Who's going to be somebody? And I'm talking about the big stuff now. Who are you going to follow? Who's somebody you really you want to end up where they're going? And you're going to follow them to that place. You know, I was, I was, we don't have a lot of young ladies in here, but I just want to say this. I guess I'll say this for Sarah and Haley and for Vivica in particular. I was, I was thinking about young women looking for a husband, and I'll look at the floor because I don't want to embarrass them or anything like that, but how you, how you go looking, how you choose is really, really important. I was talking to a Sometimes that happens when I preach. Um, <laughs> I was talking to a mom and dad just a little while ago, and they were talking about their daughter just, just really being frustrated. And uh, she had uh, set her sights on a certain guy from college and had, had pursued this relationship and pursued this relationship and pursued this relationship. And it had been going on for nearly six years and her parents had been trying to tell her all along, not marriageable material, not the guy, not the leader you're looking for, not the one. And it took her an awful long time to finally catch up to the fact that she was not assessing him accurately, and he wasn't the leader she was looking for. And so I just say that to say, who we follow matters a lot. 
it's going to affect some really substantial parts of our lives. Obviously, who we marry is going to be really important. And so learning to assess people in terms of leadership and whether they're actually servant leaders or leading for their own benefit is really important. I think we can learn a lot from just this short passage on Joshua about the things that we should look for in terms of those that we would follow in significant areas of our life. Let me just review the passage again here briefly to remind you. Verse 1 and 2, God speaks to Joshua and just says, Moses is dead. He's no longer the intermediary. God, in essence, tells Joshua, now is the time for you to step up and lead my people as I direct. Get ready to cross the Jordan River. Verses 3 through 9. I promised this land to Israel's forefathers. Now I'm telling you, go take it. I will be with you as you carry out this work. If you obey me and my covenant, then nothing and no one will be able to stop you. Verses 10 and 11. Joshua takes God's command seriously. He immediately begins to inter- administer the process of crossing. God chose Joshua, and he spoke to Joshua about his plan, God's plan. The overall plan is not Joshua's plan. God has called him to serve and lead the people as they walk out God's plan for them. So what kind of person does God choose to be a leader? Because God chose Joshua. Turn back with me to Numbers chapter 27. God did not just totally drop this on Joshua just at the last minute and say, hey, Moses is dead, by the way, you're up. It came a little bit at a time, and he told him in advance that this was going to come, but then it still must have been quite the wait when it finally showed up. Numbers 27 and verse 18. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom there is the Spirit, And lay your hand on him. Make him stand before Eleazar the priest and all the congregation, and you shall commission him in their sight. You shall invest in him some of your authority that all the the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. You guys know what that is? Sorry, I just want to stop because I want to make sure you don't. I'm not... Well, not you, Joe. Do you, do you guys know it? Okay. Um, let me stop for a second because I think this is kind of an interesting point. Did you notice at the beginning of the passage it says, God spoke to Moses. At the beginning of the other passage it says, God spoke to Joshua. Let me just say this to you. I know we're all Pentecostals here, but God talks. Amen. God talks. He wants to communicate. And so... When you're the servant leader, God wants to tell you where to go and how to lead. You're not on your own. It's not like he's saying to Joshua, okay, Joshua, um, you're here at the river. Um, Bye. Go take the land and just walk away from him. He's going to keep talking to him all the way through and communicating. What is his agenda? How is he going to do this? People, we need that every day, don't we? We need that every day. And learning to listen for God's voice in the Scripture through other people, as he just speaks to your heart, that's really important. And if you're a leader, it's doubly important. You're not on your own. He wants to guide you. He wants to show you. So, Urim and, Urim and Thummim. Can you say that with me? <laughs> Urim and Thummim. <laughs> it's a little unclear what these actually were in terms of what they looked like. But in a kind of a silly way, let me call them the holy dice, okay? Because what they had was the high priest, actually, I won't go, to, go and show you this, but they actually, you know, they created this whole vestment for the, for the priest as he went before the Lord. And he had this little container that he had on his chest. And inside of them were the urm and the thummim. Thummim, it, when you have an um on the end of a Hebrew word, it means it's plural. So the urm is a plural in the thummim. So there's 
some of these. We're not sure if there was two or if there was more exactly. But he had these, and he would then take them out when it was unclear, when God hadn't said specifically, this is how I want you to go. And so your job was to ask a question of God through the priest. Some of you are looking at me like, really? They really did? Yeah, this is what they were doing. And so the priest was there representing the people to God, and God was then going to communicate. And so they would ask God a question and say, God, what do you want us to do? And they would put down the urum and thummim, and it would say yes or no. It wouldn't speak it, but it would be like, you know, so the, the, the idea was that God was going to be able to communicate his will no matter what. In whatever situation you were in, you could go to the priest and he could communicate and say, here it is. This is what I want you to do. Now, now that I've explained that to you, all of you are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe we did that. But that is one of the ways that God was communicating. You know, John Wesley actually did that in different times. When they came to a place where they weren't clear what the Lord had told them to do, they would actually draw a lot and, and say, well, we trust that this is what the Lord is giving us. He's, give, he's giving us that communication through that way. I'm not recommending that you do that. Um, we have the Holy Spirit poured out on us after Pentecost. And so all of us literally can function as Moses and Joshua, where the Lord will communicate directly to us. But I wanted to explain to you what that was about, the Urim and the Thummim. That's where we got Yahtzee from. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I don't know how to follow up on that. That was really good. But the, let me just say this last thing. The, the concept wasn't that luck was involved. The concept was that God is in everything. And he can communicate through this. And he can make his will be known. And so he could literally move them the way he wanted to so he would be able to communicate. Okay, that took way longer than I expected. But Yahtzee is a good, good analogy. <laughs> okay, so by judging of the Urim before the Lord... At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and made him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole congregation. This is just like an ordination service, frankly. And he laid his hands on him and commissioned him as the Lord directed through Moses. So Joshua is beginning to get some of that leadership at that point. And now, Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua, it's your turn. You need to step up. God chose Joshua. He chose him. God chose Moses. God chose Joshua. We would do well to copy God's criteria for how to choose a leader. We often choose on actually pretty fleshy criteria. I looked this up. And just because I was curious about how people psychologically, how we tend to choose leaders, did you realize that most of the time when there's um, two presidential candidates, we almost always vote for the one that's taller? That has rarely happened that the shorter one became president. I hate to tell you that. We're that shallow. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Yeah, you must be bigger or something, so you're, you're going you're gonna to protect us. Somebody whose voice, do you guys remember Ross Perot? Yeah. You know, I, I remember watching with my kids Sesame Street at the time, and you wouldn't remember Ross Perot because you were a little kid at the time, but Ross had this kind of voice like that, <laughs> and they made fun of him on Sesame Street, and they called him H. Ross Parrot, <laughs> and they were just joking, and, and he, he came in a, a distant third as president because... It wasn't because his ideas weren't any good. It's because his voice was annoying. I'm, I'm serious. People are like, I'm not voting for that guy because I have to listen to him for four years. <laughs> I'm not going to vote for him. So taller, voice sounds nice. You know, ladies, let me go back to you, young women. Those are not good criteria for choosing a husband. I'm not saying you need to go looking for Quasimodo, but, you know... <laughs> 
Yeah, now I have to explain it. Gosh, I, Quasimodo was the name of the hunchback of Notre Dame, okay? You, don't, you have to look for, you know, I'm not saying you have to go looking for the ugliest guy, but there's a whole lot more important criteria than the things that we'll often choose leaders on. We like the sound of their voice, or they're tall, or we like their jawline, or what have you. You know, those just aren't very important. But the reality is, we got to choose, don't we? We have to choose. We're going to have to follow because leadership's everywhere. And so how do, we, how do we go about this process? How do we look for a leader? How do we assess? And especially those who would purport to speak and lead on behalf of God. How do we do it? Principle number one. Joshua spent a lot of time with Moses in God's presence. You want to look for somebody who knows God. You know, that may sound really obvious, but we don't do that a lot, actually. We'll actually follow leaders who we think are smarter than us or are taller than us or what have you. But if you're really going to find a good leader, somebody who is a servant leader, they need to be close to God. So, young girls, if you're looking for a husband, find somebody who's close to God. Somebody who's got that heart, like God's heart, who will care for you, not dominate you. Somebody who will look for your interests ahead of their own. Somebody who's there to serve, like God. You might remember in places in the, in the Exodus where Moses goes into the temp, tent of meeting. You remember this passage? Moses would go into the tent of meeting and he'd talk to God and God says, Moses is faithful in all my house. I talk to him face to face. He didn't do that with any other except Jesus himself. But the other person that was there was Joshua. Joshua would attend Moses and sit in the corner probably over there in the tent of meeting while God and Moses are talking. Man, would that be an interesting job. But Joshua spent a lot of time talking, listening to Moses, and listening to God. That's a really important criteria when you're looking for a leader. They ought to be somebody, I'm not talking about big stuff, but somebody who you think really has a relationship with God and they're willing to listen to him and pay attention to him. Principle number two. Joshua waited a long time to become the leader. A godly leader must first serve, then lead as he or she is directed by God, not at a time of their own choosing. Godly leaders serve God and the people they lead, not their own ambitions. Multiple leaders spoke against Moses during the time of the wilderness wandering, but Joshua never sought, never sought to usurp Moses. We should rightly be suspicious of self-appointed leaders. Someone who's really eager to lead makes me nervous. <laughs> you know what it tells me? It tells me they haven't led very much. They're not ready for it yet. Because you'll find when you lead, um, I don't want to discourage you from leading. I want you to lead. But you will find not everybody is so eager to follow. Some people will be right with you, and they're like, hey, lead us, let's go, this will be great. And other people are like, prove it. And they'll not want to, they'll not want to follow. And somebody who's just anxious to jump in and say, hey, come follow me, I think they probably just haven't led very much. And so the person who self-appoints, you need to be careful of that person. You really do. You need to pay very close attention to them because it's a, it's, a, it's a fearful thing. It's a careful thing that we have to do when we lead. You all remember King David. Just like Joshua, he waited a very long time before he became the king. God chose him too, didn't he? He said, David's a man after my own heart. And he made him then wait for a very long time before he actually got to assume the kingship. 
He was chased around. You realize he was chased around by Saul for like 13 years in the wilderness? And he had numerous opportunities to usurp the throne by killing Saul, and he wouldn't do it. He refused to do it. That's somebody I'd be willing to follow. Because they were following, he was following God first and not his own ambition. He wasn't just looking to be king. He was looking to obey God and do what God told him to do. Principle number three. Joshua was submitted to Moses. A godly leader is under authority. Even the most powerful leaders have others to answer to. God is the only leader who has nobody to answer to. We must always be concerned about a leader who has no check on his or her power. Everybody has blind spots. Everybody has flesh. The best leaders will always set up policies that limit their freedom of action so they don't make huge mistakes by acting on their own without other advisors' input. I think that stands on its own, probably. Principle number four. Joshua was faithful to God. A godly leader doesn't receive his... Excuse me. A godly... Yeah. I'm going to speak. I'm going to move my lips and words are going to come out. A godly leader doesn't receive his instruction from God and then ignore him. He remains faithful, teachable, and humble before God. Just note there at the end of that passage that we were reading in Joshua. This is verses 10 and 11. God gets done talking. He's spoken to Joshua. He's given him instructions. He said, be strong. This is what I want you to do. And verse 10, Joshua turns then to those who are his subordinates. He commands the officers of the people Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare. Prepare. I, I don't want a show of hands on this because it would, it would probably make me have to raise both hands multiple times. How many times have you heard from God and then not stepped out on it? <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Lots of times. But the godly leader is somebody who's taking God seriously and then taking the step, even though they're not quite sure how God's going to work this out, how this is exactly going to happen. Now, think about this for just a second. Put yourself in Joshua's shoes, okay? So picture yourself. You've been on a sandy, a sandy shore near the Dead Sea next to a river, it's springtime, okay? You've got two million people following you. You just became the leader of the guy that nobody can follow. I mean, follow up, be behind, okay? Two million people are looking at you like, what do we do next? And God tells you, I want you to cross that river. Okay, you got two million people. How much livestock do you think two million people probably have with them? Okay, mind you, it's springtime, which means the snows are melting. The river is now at flood stage. Have any of you seen the Jordan River? Okay. Do y'all know what the Puyallup River looks like? Do y'all mostly know what the Green River looks like? Okay. There's diff big difference, isn't there, between the wintertime and the springtime. I mean, they got those big levees on the sides of the Green River, and you can see it where... You know, all those businesses are right next to the river, and it's like, whoop, it's creeping up, and everybody's going, whoa, are we staying or going, you know? That's when this was for the River Jordan. I've been in the River Jordan, actually saw it, been in it, baptized a couple people in it. It was kind of fun. It was fish nibbling on my legs. I kid you not. It was a very fertile river. But the point is, it's, it's not huge. It's not the Amazon, but it's like the Green River, and how would you like to take 2 million people across the Green River at flood stage? Mind you, there's no bridge. There's no ferry. And God just told you, okay, take these 2 million people, 
and the couple of million animals they have with them, and we're going to cross this river. How many people are going, yes, sir, I am on that? We'd all be going, what are you talking about? What's the plan, God? How in the world am I going to get all these people? I can't even probably get my warriors across this river, let alone all these little kids and their sheep. What does he do? He says, in three days we're crossing the river. He tells everybody, this is what we're going to do. How many people want to be the leader right now? Yeah, I want that job. That sounds like a lot of fun. That's great. I am going to be standing here at the edge of the river going, okay, now what? <laughs> Mike's going to work it out. We're going to, we're going to work this out. Let's build a dam. He didn't tell Joshua how to do it. He just told him we're going to do it. <laughs> you know, a godly leader is somebody who's willing to take a step of faith. Somebody who's willing to take the step when God just says, tell you what we're going to do, and you don't know how it's going to happen. But they're willing to follow God anyway. Even though the river's at flood stage, and this makes no sense. Have you heard the phrase, the time you need a miracle is because you're up against it. you got to have a miracle or you're just out of luck. you got to have one now. The godly leader is the one who's willing to do that and trust that God's going to be willing to do his part and step into it with you. Joshua was faithful to do that work. I don't know if you guys remember, it's, it's further on in our story, of course, but you remember God parted the Red Sea for Moses? God stopped the Jordan for Joshua. He actually stopped the Jordan River so that they could cross. But it took an awful lot of faith, an awful lot of courage to say, this is what God's telling us to do, so here we go. And so they, he sent the priests, and they started walking into the water. Like, are you sure about this? <laughs> Is this what you really want us to do? And then they walked, and then the river stopped, and the people went across. Who wants to be the leader now? Who wants to self-appoint and say, yeah, I'll be the one? It's really good for us to wait for God. Wait for God's servant leader to lead us, to do what he tells us to do and not what we feel like ought to be done. Because he knows what he's doing, even when we don't. Would you stand with me?